music is good depending on how it makes you feel. How does music make you feel? Does it make you feel seen and heard? And I think design is the same way. Like we perceive something to be well designed when it makes us, when an experience makes us feel seen. Like, ah, somebody anticipated my needs before I even understood that I needed it myself. Or how did it make me feel in terms of not only being seen, but did it bring me joy? Do I feel loved? Did it make me happy? You know, and so that's ultimately what we're leaving people with as we design things is we're leaving them with a feeling. I'm Ron Dror, and this is Remake, a podcast about design, systems, and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Today, I'm talking to Irene Al. Irene is a design partner at Costa Ventures, where she works with early, mid, and late-stage startup CEOs. She is dedicated to raising the strategic value of design and user research within software companies through better methods, practices, processes, leadership, talent, and quality. Irene has unprecedented experience elevating the strategic importance of design within technology companies, having built and led the entire user experience and design teams at Google, Yahoo, and Udacity. She began her career as an interaction designer at Netscape Communications, where she worked on the design of the internet's first commercial web browser. Irene also teaches yoga at Avalon Yoga Center in Palo Alto, where she is among the teacher training program faculty and is a frequent author and speaker on mindfulness practices, design, and creativity. An adjunct lecturer at Stanford University, she teaches product design in the mechanical engineering department. Irene also serves as a trustee for the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Museum of Design. Irene authored a definitive O'Reilly book, Design in Venture Capital, and her popular essays can be found on Medium. She has been featured in Wired Magazine, Fast Company Magazine, Come Arts Magazine, and on the cover of Mindful Magazine. We talked at the beginning of May 2022, and I was very excited to talk to Irene because of her remarkable journey as a design leader in tech, and because she was leading design at Google at the time that Jake Knapp started developing the Design Sprint methodology there and gave him the space he needed to experiment and innovate on the process. It was lovely to hear from her first-person accounts of all of these very different companies, Netscape, Yahoo, Google, and see how she perceived their different cultures as a design leader trying to promote human-centered design. We talked about developing listening skills as an introspective child and uh, how feeling like an outsider helped her develop those skills. Her electrical engineering studies and her transition into looking at how technology influences society and people and, and how we live. We talk about her time at Netscape and tying together the products for a consistent look and feel across uh, you know, a, a suite of products that came out at the time called Netscape Communicator. And we talk about her move from Netscape to Yahoo and what went wrong for Yahoo um, as a company trying to find its way. We talk about her time at Google and we look at it from all angles. Uh, Google is considered a very techie culture that, that, you know, at least early on didn't really pay attention to design but at the same time had several big successful products that people liked. So what was the state of design at Google before she joined and what were the changes she tried to implement as she brought human-centered design and practices to Google? We also talk about hiring strategies, staff training, and how design workshops became the design sprint ultimately at Google. And we talk about what is design, what is a designer, and briefly cover the role of the designer in venture capital. I think my greatest takeaway from this interview is a sense of hope that someone like Irene is able to walk into these very techie cultures and produce real change. And all it takes is really showing the value of the work and being willing to engage and promote better practices. 
I think Irene will be an inspiration to many non-engineers who find themselves in heavy engineering cultures and want to make a contribution. This conversation with Irene is one of many weekly conversations we already have lined up for you with thinkers, best-selling authors, designers, makers, scientists, impact entrepreneurs, and others who are working to change our world for the better. So please follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app or head over to remakepod.org to subscribe. And now let's jump right in with Irene Au. Right. I'm sitting here with Irene Au. Irene, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. And so usually we like to start the conversation with kind of a general check-in. So my first question is always, what's it like to, to be you and to be where you are today? I feel incredibly fortunate and blessed to have the situation that I have where I'm not in a war zone. I have my family nearby or healthy for the most part. And, um, you know, I'm relatively comfortable. I'm able to do my work remotely. So mm. I have no complaints. I feel incredibly fortunate and grateful. Yeah. In one of your talks, I saw your award-winning super well-designed house. So I'm guessing that's a, that's probably a pretty nice place to be in isolation. I'm very lucky to have a nice place. It's filled yeah. with light and it has everything we need. Yeah, it looks amazing. Yeah, and I, I feel the same, definitely. Like, I'm, you know, have a very nice, large, quiet apartment all to myself with lots of natural sunlight and nature around. So even when we were in isolation, I could go for a walk around in, in nature and, and it was so life-giving. And I definitely know that's not everybody's experience. And so to get into your journey, we have this regular opener question. People who listen to the podcast kind of know by heart uh, by now, but what's something you learned in childhood or early in life that still drives or guides you today? You know, my childhood, I feel like it was pretty lonely. Mm. Um, I was very introspective. So I had imaginary friends, but not a very active social uh, life ex outside of that. I grew up in South Carolina, not very many Chinese people there. My mm. parents are immigrants from Hong Kong. And my father was a physics professor at the university in the town where I grew up. It's in the heart of the Bible Belt. So the church is the center of mm. religious life. And my father, having grown up in Catholic schools, renounced his Catholicism and is a profound atheist. So we were neither part of any church, nor were we oh. like other people in our community. So it was very isolating. And I was also a very small, petite person. So mm. not particularly athletic, but very studious. I love to read. I often joke that my early experiences as an Asian woman, a petite Asian woman growing up in South Carolina, really prepared me for a career in technology, <laughs> especially mm. in design, where, mm. you know, I don't necessarily have the social capital or the currency, you know, that's bestowed upon me just because of, you know, my background or whatever. I'm not coming in with any authority. And so it's a lot of leading by persuasion, getting things done without having any control over anything being sort of the underdog. So you start to, I mean, for me, I had to really hone and develop my listening skills and negotiation skills and mm. being able to get along with people who are very different from me. And I think all of those qualities that I had to cultivate to survive as a child kind of came in really handy uh, yeah. later in life. Oh, that's amazing. And, and I think probably just even uh, as a woman in tech, right? As a woman in tech, you're you're already a minority. Exactly. And and so if you're used to it, maybe it's less intimidating. Perhaps. Uh, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in college, I was one of two or three women in my class. I studied electrical engineering. And um, it, it actually didn't bother me. It didn't faze me that I was just one of a few women in the class. And I, I think that also helped prepare me for a career in tech as a woman. Yeah. So how did you find yourself in design? Did you transition into studying design? Did you discover that that was what you like to do? How, how, what was that transition like? Yeah. So I studied electrical and computer engineering as an undergrad, and I went to graduate school 
originally with the intention to get a PhD in electrical computer engineering, I thought I wanted to do VLSI chip design, um, but oh. I didn't really know. And when I got to the University of Illinois, I this is when I really felt different because um, it's a massive school. I went there because it was ranked number one in electrical and computer engineering above MIT at that time. Wow. Um, but I felt really different from everyone else in ways that I hadn't before. I felt like a lot of my peers were just building technology for the sake of technology. And I was mm. more interested in how technology influenced society and people and how we live and how we interact with each other and vice versa, how human needs should influence the development of technology. And just by sheer coincidence, I happened to run into a friend when I was studying one night and he pulled out his textbook. It was Engineering Psychology and Human Factors written by Chris Wickens. I had never even heard of the field before. And I flipped through his textbook and I was like, wow, this is, this is really interesting. And the guy who wrote the textbook, literally, he was at the University of Illinois in the psychology department. Wow. And then soon after that, I was in my computer architecture class I was flipping through my textbook that was written by John Hennessy, who later became president at Stanford. But in that textbook was this graph from IBM Research, and it was a it was a graph from their human factors research department, and I think it was illustrating like Fitz Law or something like that. And I was like, wow, it was the first time I realized that there could be a whole department or an organization and in industry looking at these kinds of issues the psychology mm. of technology or the interaction between people and a machine and how they influence each other. So I researched who at the university was doing research in this area, because if the guy who wrote the textbook was there, surely there must be other people who were doing this. And I wrote to several professors, introducing myself and explaining myself. And there was one professor in particular who wrote me back. Her name was Penny Sanderson, and she was a professor in the mechanical and industrial engineering. She was doing research on cognitive engineering. And mm. this was like in the mid nineties before people really had heard of human computer interaction. You really could not study this in school, but she was looking for someone with coding skills because she was developing software. And I had the coding skills and she in exchange agreed to take me on as a research assistant and taught me everything she knew. And so I pulled together my own program of study drawing from the departments of psychology, computer science, um, industrial engineering, and I kind of created my own program of study in human computer interaction. And around this time mm. is also when I discovered Don Norman's book, The Psychology of Everyday Things. That book was yeah. life changing for me. And that's really what led me to decide like, this is my life's work. This is what I want to devote my career towards. Yeah. And you've done so many incredible things, right? You've been a director of user experience at Google and you've been at Yahoo and leading all these amazing companies. But for me, the thing that makes me kind of giddy and excited like a fanboy is the Netscape years because Netscape was everything when, the, when we just discovered the internet and downloading Netscape Navigator and that little animation uh, with the N and the comets coming through. So cool. It was so <laughs> cool. So you know, so how did you get into Netscape and what was it like to be involved with one of the first browsers? Oh, I mean, it was exhilarating. Um, I did not actually know the guys who founded Netscape. They were also from the University of Illinois. They created NCSA Mosaic maybe a year before I joined Illinois. And they left around the time that I was coming in. But because NCSA Mosaic was developed there, it was really a huge part of Illinois life. Like the, they were amongst the first in the country to put their course catalog online. They were experimenting with web usability and, you know, putting content and making things findable. And so this was just such a huge part of my experience there. So it was really without a question that I wanted to work there. And I did entertain offers from other places. Like I remember I got an offer from Belcor in New Jersey and they tried to sell mm -hmm. me on like the opportunity to go in New Jersey and, and buy bigger land and bigger houses with the same amount of salary as I would at Netscape. But my fiance was from LA and he really wanted to move back to California. So it was just never a question. But I was, I was fortunate enough to get an interview there. And really through showing the work that I did as a graduate student, showed kind of like the depth of thought and attention paid to the design details and the considerations that were made around what did the technology enable and what could we actually do to support user needs and behavioral patterns like that just really sealed it for the design team there. So I was hired there. And, you know, back then it was just so fun because everybody who was working on the internet 
were just really passionate about it. Um, mm. We weren't there to make money. We just did it because we loved it, you know. And to this day, I still, I mean, one of my best friends, she's like a sister to me. And I met her at Netscape. I'm still friends with a lot of people that were there. Um, I got the best mentorship of my life. I mean, it really was exhilarating. And yeah. I think it gave me a really great foundation because there were a lot of strong women who worked there and you could see how they operated in meetings, things like that. And they just offered such a great model to follow, uh, which mm. was very inspiring for me to see. Wow. So you essentially right out of school, get this opportunity. That's, that's incredible. And for, for me, I mean, I was, um, was I in high school? I wasn't even in high school. I was, I think I was in middle school. I think we had mosaic and I used mosaic to download Netscape. And it was, and nobody had the internet in my, you know, in my classroom. It was like such a pioneering thing. And Netscape was so cool. And I remember upgrading to communicator. And so that had email and other things. And so, yeah. To, so what were, what were you involved in? So, you know, what were you in charge of? How, what was the product like? It's a lot of designers listening to this. So, was, you know, it'd be interesting to hear kind of the challenges of the early internet. Yeah, yeah. So I was one of the people on Communicator really acting as a global, I was actually the only designer acting as a global lead looking across platform, across the suite of products that Communicator was, which included the browser, the mail news client, the calendar, the page editor. We had bought a company called CS Time, which became Netscape Calendar. So I was the lead designer on that. So I've, I've thought about calendaring and contact management and mail and news for a long, long time. Nice. <laughs> but then I was also named to be like the global lead. So thinking about the cross product experience, like across the suite of products, how do you tie them in together so that there's a consistent look and feel and a common model of interaction, but then also looking across platform. And at the time we developed a separate suite like there was a de separate development stack for the Mac OS and then one for Unix and one for Windows. And they all had different interface guidelines, different conventions for establishing the menu bar and what menus were like. Yeah. So it really required me to look very holistically at everything. So, and it was nice to get this perspective across product. It really forced me to build bridges across many organizations, all the different platform teams and then all the different product teams. It was an incredibly complicated organization. And I had the good fortune of being able to work with anyone. I developed this reputation. Actually, they gave me this award. They used to give awards out whenever we had a launch. And my award was Jump Into the Fire Award because hmm. my managers, <laughs> my leads, would always throw me into really difficult situations where there might be a tough stakeholder because for some reason they felt like, I had developed really great skills around listening and negotiation with these people who are very opinionated and often thought that they knew better, you know, in terms of what the Macintosh convention should be. And in some cases they did because they had long careers working for Apple before and things like that. And so that was one of my superpowers, I guess, was going into these situations with like disgruntled engineers or people who are very opinionated <laughs> and yeah. then having to like smooth things out with them and, and negotiate across boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess maybe maybe that is a, des a core design skill is the ability to translate between these different languages. Because I, I remember whenever business and technology needed to talk about something, they would grab me <laughs> into the room to be able to ha to help them with the conversation. So what he means is blah blah blah, blah and it's like you know what he means is, and um, maybe that is part of our role as designers, right? Is to to, to translate these different languages. But uh, so, I, I, yeah, I do remember like the communicator street, they had these really cool icons and they, they definitely had their own style. And I think this was one of my first instances of really appreciating product design and, and thinking, how cool is this? This is like, this is really cool. Oh, I used to have just a navigator. Now I have a few of them and they're all part of the same family. For some reason, I don't think I felt the same way about Office, which we also had, but, but like this felt more mm -hmm. kind of very unified. So you then, I think, continue on from Netscape to Yahoo, mm -hmm. which is, is, is it a very different culture? It feels like it would be very different. 
It was very different. So Yahoo at that time was a web directory. It was a hand curated web directory. Their job titles literally were web surfers. And their job was to surf the internet and find cool websites and put them in a hand curated library. (laughs) And they were starting to evolve to offer more products and services. So at the time, they had just launched my Yahoo, which was personalized Yahoo. They bought 411, which had Rocket Mail, which eventually became Yahoo Mail. And mm. so it was around this time that the guy who hired me, Dave Shen, um, started looking for somebody with my background. They wanted somebody with a background in human computer interaction to help build a human centered design practice. So I came on board as the first interaction designer. Some of my earliest projects were the launch of Yahoo Yellow Pages and Yahoo Messenger. Yeah. And um, was cool. I was also tasked with, <laughs> yeah, that, was a was cute, really that was one of the cooler messengers back then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Yahoo calendar was also one of my projects. I mean, they were all great people. I mean, the people at Yahoo are just like so much heart. Um, and still some of my closest friends, I built our first usability labs and, and, and that was very interesting too, because prior to my arrival, no one had ever really watched any like users use their products before. So there was this kind of voyeuristic quality where people were just so fascinated to like sit down and watch other people use what they had created. But that was kind of the Trojan horse into being able to work with teams. And, you know, like there was no top down mandate for any of the producers, which they were product managers, but back then they were called producers. There was no mandate for them or for the engineers to work with me or with anybody I hired. So this Mm. was really about building up demand from the ground up and being like the people that everybody wanted to work with. And so back then everybody like thought they could do web design because it was pretty easy to throw together some HTML, but to think through how you move people through an experience like a movie um, Mm. to help users achieve their goals through the offering of tasks and done in a way that's consistent, easy to learn and easy to use. That was something that was not like a core strength at the time that um, we had to first demonstrate where the pitfalls were in the interface and where the shortcomings were in order to drum up motivation by the team to work with us and to create a better reality. So that was really fun and exhilarating experience. And um, yeah, the culture was definitely different from Netscape. It was, you know, more of a media kind of culture, whereas Netscape, they were hardcore computer scientists and nerds. And a lot of the Netscape people ended up at Google and are Mm. now at Google today. Um, I kind of think of Google as being kind of the the new version of Netscape, you know, a lot of the ideas that we had at Netscape, they were just before their time, like the technology wasn't there. And it's so interesting to see these concepts brought to life through Google, things like the cloud back then at Netscape, we called it location independence, you know, (laughs) just things like that. But yeah, Yeah. that was Netscape and that was Yahoo. (laughs) Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. So I get to Google in a second. So, but I'm wondering, because when I think of Yahoo, first of all, I remember my Yahoo and I remember for a long time, it was my homepage on the browser because you could really design it. I mean, back then it was one of the coolest things that you could do and you could start your your day with. But my sense of Yahoo, and I was never inside of Yahoo, but my sense of Yahoo is like they executed pretty well. So, I mean, they had like, a, a, the design looked good. A lot of them particular, like the, the Google Messenger, we talked about uh, Yahoo Messenger and Yahoo Mail, they were good products in terms of their design, but somehow nothing actually materialized. I mean, they could have, it felt like a, some sort of lost opportunity. They could have been what Google is. They could have been something yeah. more world changing. Yes. So w- w- what do you think happened there? What, what's that? <laughs> that? This is like a whole nother podcast episode. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. But um, I, I will just go through briefly a few things. One is that there was never really the common technical infrastructure that allowed Yahoo to scale in the way that Google could scale. Mm. Just as an example, Yahoo had multiple listings platforms. We had hot jobs. We had Yahoo classifieds, Yahoo autos, Yahoo personals, et cetera, et cetera. And those were all separate listings platforms. Oh my so God. each yeah. team that developed those had to reinvent the wheel every single time. There was no common code, no common infrastructure. Now, Google, on the other hand, as soon as Google acquires any company, and the first thing they do is get those companies on Google infrastructure so they can benefit off the scale and Mm. leverage that. Now, the flip side of it is that Yahoo is always very user-centered, and the people who worked there and ran the company had a lot of heart. They were very in touch with the human element. 
And so that allowed us to create products that really landed emotionally with people. Like our users were just like fanatical about Yahoo at the time. Like they felt like this was my friend, like, you know, people at Yahoo are friendly and they care about me. And this is really fun. It was an irreverent brand. Google uh, has had a very different kind of emotional relationship with its users. But the flip side of that is like Google actually at one point did launch a listings platform. It was called Google Base. And it could have evolved into anything. It could have evolved into a, you know, a classifieds platform. It could have evolved into a jobs listing site, whatever. But at the time, Google did not have in its DNA the focus on human-centered design. And so when they launched Google Base, people were like, what the heck is this? I don't even know what this is or how am I supposed to use it? But going back to, you know, like some of the challenges that Yahoo had. So one is that it didn't have the technical infrastructure. It, as a result, ran really inefficiently. The second is, and this is not in any kind of order of priority by any means, but I think it was really risk averse. My team went through an annual exercise where we kind of did a visioning project and would uh, look into the future based on different themes, like what might Yahoo look like if everything's personalized? What might Yahoo look like when we leverage the community and make everything at Yahoo better because of the community. And, you know, this was like in the late 90s, early 2000s, we had already conceived of products like Facebook even before Facebook existed. But I think the company was really reluctant to invest in things that were not immediately revenue generating. Like in hindsight, it's very easy for us to look back and say, oh, yeah, like if you have the social graph, then you can monetize people more effectively, blah, 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 blah. But at the time, you know, it was unclear how if we really focused on building up community, that that would benefit the company because all the community focused products that we had, like Yahoo Groups, Yahoo Messenger, et cetera, et cetera, like those were very hard to monetize. Those products were very difficult to monetize. And then I would also say like after the first dot-com crash in the early 2000s, the company reorganized into different business units. Every product brand became its own profit and loss P&L, its own Mm. profit center and its own cost center. So that meant that Yahoo Sports was competing with Yahoo Personals, which was competing with Yahoo Mail, which was competing, you know, so they were all fighting internally for resources and there was not incentive to invest in central infrastructure. So this is going back to the infrastructure piece. It led to a lot of inefficiencies. It also led to a very fragmented brand because suddenly Yahoo Sports saw its primary competitor as being ESPN. Yahoo Personal saw its primary competitor as being Match.com mm. and so on and so forth. And so everybody was like really focused on who they perceived their primary competitor was, which then had a ripple effect into the look and feel. For example, the sports team wanted a look and feel that looked very masculine with slanted edges. That was like a fad at the time where all your tabs, your navigation tabs would have a slanted edge. They wanted like lots of blue and red and white. Yahoo personals needed to attract more women onto the platform in order to Mm. get more men. (laughs) They said the men will come as long as the women are there. We need to focus on the women. So they wanted a very feminine kind of look and feel, rounded corners, soft pastel color palette. The movies team wanted to, you know, have a black background. And so it was, there was no support from the very top to create a single look and feel. The Mm. threat was like, if you don't get on board with what these different product teams want, you know, in terms of having a competitive look against their vertical player, then they'll just go outside and they'll go outsource the look and feel. This idea of having a single unified brand and look and feel and how that played out across the network, that was just not a huge focus for the leadership at that time at Yahoo. I mean, the people who owned the P&Ls were all from sales and business development backgrounds. They were not product people. CEO at the very top was Terry Semmel, who came from Warner Brothers, who had never been at an internet company before. And the CEO, Dan Rosenzweig, had a sales background. So it's just, you know, I've always said that companies, as they grow and evolve, they, they reflect the leadership. And when David Philo and Jerry Yang were running the company, it was one thing. And then when Terry Semmel became CEO and, and Dan Rosenzweig became COO, then it became another thing. And then after many iterations and evolutions later, it, it sort of lost its soul which is very difficult to see. And in contrast, Google, I think, was amazing at operationalizing the vision that Larry and Sergey had. It was impenetrable, actually, (laughs) Um, which had its own interesting set of challenges. But that's why there's always been a singular vision for what Google is and how it plays out. It has a very opinionated point of view, and that plays out 
in the way it spends money, the way it invests, and, and, and it manifests in the user experience, but that's just one part of it. Yeah. And it, I mean, it, it, it is an incredible thing that they Google and we, which now we're going to get to, but they were able to move from being pretty terrible at design, let's be frank, to being a leader in design with founders who are not designers, which is such an incredible thing. Well, I actually think that many companies that excel in design are not founded by leaders who are designers. Airbnb might be the exception, but I think what's more important is that they enable. I, I, I think that's really interesting. That's a really interesting point. I, I would love to dive into it, but like we work mostly with startups, right? And so uh, with the startup, and if you have really technical founders, and sometimes it's hard to look at the a good design versus bad design and even know what's better if you are mostly concerned about the tech. And so being able to build that in capacity over time and having trusted people and enabling the right people to me is an, ach- is an achievement. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, first of all, I disagree with the notion that Google was really crappy with design in the old days. I understand where that sentiment comes from. Mm. And I kind of agreed with it to a degree, but Uh just to be contrarian, I'd like to be thought provoking here. And, you know, it was terrible with design in regard to visual design for sure. Mm. And we can talk about the reasons for that. But Mm. in terms of being very opinionated and principled about what Google was, what the product should be, who they're designing for, what they're optimizing for, there was always a very strong, clear point of view. And that is why Google is successful even today and what led to their success. This idea around scale, the idea around um, algorithms offering the excellence, the idea that they were always going to design for the advanced user. And this goes back to your earlier question about like, why did Yahoo fail? I should also mention that in addition to being risk averse, they were optimizing for the lowest common denominator. So like as successive generations of browsers got released, Yahoo was very slow to adopt new web technologies because they didn't want to alienate the people who are still using old browsers. And this is Mm. before we had Chrome with automatic software updates. You know, back then, in order to upgrade your browser, you had to like go to the website and download the new browser, install it. Like how many people actually knew how to do that? Like most people actually didn't. And so Yahoo, maybe rightly so, was reluctant to adopt things like DHTML, for example, because they feared that it would alienate so many users and we would lose all these users. Now, Google had a very opposite approach. Google was like, we are always going to develop for the most extreme advanced user. And the thinking there was that eventually the rest of the world would come and catch up to them. (laughs) And with automatic software updates and things like that, which were, you know, because we had Chrome, we can make that a reality. And that was starting to become more popular uh, as a concept. Like, you know, we didn't have to worry about the laggards and things like that. So part of it is like just the context and the circumstances under which these companies were operating, but Mm. also the philosophy. And speed was top of mind for both companies everything they did from an operation standpoint was optimized around, you know, offering the lowest latency possible Mm. for Yahoo. That meant that David Philo wrote this lint um, (laughs) software that would like strip out all the extra spaces in any kind of code. So that like when you downloaded a web page, you wouldn't have to download all these extra extraneous characters that would slow everything down. Mm. I mean, that was kind of how extreme it was. And with Google, they would have days where they would deliberately slow down the machines for all the engineers just to frustrate them, to motivate them, to make their products more performant. Yeah. And they also invested billions of dollars of capital outlay to make sure that web search infrastructure was as fast as possible. You know, so I would say Google from the beginning was very designed. It just wasn't very visually perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, that that was an interesting cultural moment for them, too. Let, let, so let me I agree with you, but also uh, somewhat push back because I think it will lead us in an interesting direction. So, you know, I think clearly search was well designed. I also think clearly ads mm-hmm. were well designed and a few other products like Gmail. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned base and I think about wave and I think about Google plus, and I think about how they launched Google Hangouts. 
as a as a, mm-hmm. a way to hang out with your friends instead of the obvious thing that it was that was uh, like a business meeting tool so you know what, what how would you explain that so i mean I, I, clearly there's something mm-hmm. there that's like not fully aligned with the user yeah google is a federation of startups and so like the success or failure of any particular product is a function of the little team that works on it so you know the gmail team had they were an amazing team they mm-hmm. understood mail They understood that people didn't have to worry so much about deleting messages because mm. um, we had growing amounts of storage space. And so that allowed them to completely change the mental model for how you interact with mail, like through archiving and things like that. And then they could also take advantage of keyboards shortcuts because they They could use DHTML, you know, whereas Yahoo wouldn't. You know, Google Base was like a, a side project that somebody had. It wasn't like a huge, Um, no. I mean, Google ma- Gmail was also a 20% project. Every, everything started out as a 20% project. But yeah. I think in order to have an innovative company, you have to make space for the winners and the failures, the experiments that, you know, sure. it's okay to like launch something, see if the spaghetti sticks to the wall. And, you know, maybe it sticks, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> um, yeah. In the case of base, at least it was easy to kill that. Because nobody used it I think in the case of Google reader that was like really painful because it had like a million and a half users or something and it was actually a really good product but mm-hmm. it wasn't enough users for Google to keep it going so right. I think killing things is emotionally the tougher part but you know I think the fact that Google had these products that launched and failed is not a failure of Google by any means I see it mm-hmm. as a, I celebrate that they were so innovative at the time and that they you created space for creative people who are motivated and interested and curious to go make something and yeah. and see what happens Google plus is an entirely different animal that I <laughs> could go into a lot of detail about because my husband was one of the leaders of that initiative. Mm. but this is that you know that was that was a separate thing where it was not a 20% project but it was something where you know the company saw it as a competitive you know social as a competitive threat and did mm. not you have enough focus on social in its in the company DNA mm. to get it and to come up with its own offering that was unique and um, you know we had an executive who was not my husband who came from a culture where you know the, the strategy at his former company was often you copy your competitor and then you build off of that which is fine a lot of companies do that but it just didn't work for Google and and that was unfortunate and, and Google wave by the way was also a 20% project yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's interesting to see the concepts of wave have found new life in in products like notion or coda or things like that you know sure. so the ideas were robust but the the execution wasn't there. You're listening to Remake, a podcast about design systems and society. If you're listening on a podcast app, you already know how to follow podcasts. So please follow this one. If you're listening in a browser, just go to remakepod.org to find links to all the major podcast players where you can follow our show. Yeah, no, I, th- I think that's right. And, and with, with plus, like I, I often give the example when I do like UX and product talks, uh, I give the, the like button versus the plus one button. And I say, okay, if you're looking at those two and you think that they are equally well designed, you know, consult, consult, consult a designer because, you know, the like button is a human interaction that, you know, one person telling the other person, I like what you wrote. And plus one is, was an invention, right? It wasn't like it wasn't communicating anything. And then you know I, one time I gave a lecture and uh, and I had like pushback from uh, from uh, an engineer friend of mine. It was like, really? Like I got it immediately. And then someone in the crowd was like, I never got what that was. I never got what that plus one was. <laughs> you know that that was um <laughs> plus one came from a very ingrained part of Google culture where yeah. like, Anytime there's like an email thread or conversation online, you know, people chime and say plus one. It was a very normal part of Google life, yeah. um, but, you know, not something that is immediately recognizable to people outside of Google. And that was part of the problem. And we, I think the team was hoping that, you know, they could like 
export a little bit of Google culture to the rest of the world. And that, you know, kind of in the same spirit as like, you know, as before when Larry and Sergey used to say, you know, we're designing for people like us. I think there was some hope or expectation that that would land that way. But Hmm. that, that is the least of why that product failed, but I don't want to belabor it too much. Yeah. I know what you say. Sorry. All right. I do want to hear about your experience. You you come in, you know, into this very senior role. You're the director of user experience, right? And uh, leading this globally. I know you said it's it's very similar to Netscape in culture. So I think that's kind of interesting. But if I remember correctly, there were very few designers at Google at the time. So how do you think about infusing design into this culture? Yeah. So let me just about what Google looks like when I joined. We had about 100 people on the UI team. That's what it was called at the time. About 60 UI designers, most of whom were fresh graduates straight out of school. And uh, 40 were called usability analysts. And Larry, at the time, actively managed the ratio of engineers to everybody else inside the company. So he deliberately kept the ratio heavily tilted towards engineering because he wanted Google to be an engineering-driven company. He also personally reviewed every single resume of every single person we wanted to make an offer to. So it was not uncommon to try to make an offer to a designer and have it rejected by Larry because the person wasn't technical enough, because he also required that all designers coming into Google had to have a technical background. Mm -hmm. And so this is why the typical profile of a Google designer at the time was somebody who was a recent graduate from Carnegie Mellon's computer science department who might have studied human computer interaction, you know, and he was, he was optimizing for that. And the operations of the company really, you know, set things up so that uh, you could not break out of that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was very hard to change the mold of what kinds of designers were brought into the company. And the few designers who came in, you know, who had a visual design background, like Doug Bowman or Jamie Devine, like Doug was originally hired as a contractor for Google Calendar. And then because of some IRS accounting issue, where most of his income was coming from Google, he had to be converted to full time to avoid some kind of penalty or something like that. It was really just like a loophole that, you know, resulted in conversion. Anyway, so there are a couple of things that, you know, we had to do. One was I had to change the title and expectations and requirements for the user researchers, I changed it from usability analyst to user researcher, because at the time that I joined, they were mostly doing design QA. They were mostly doing usability studies. People would kind of submit a request to get a usability study, and then they would service the ticket. And then they would come back with a report describing all the things that worked well or didn't work well. And then the team would have to go and do something about it. And I had a vision of diversifying our basket of research skills and abilities so that it was not just summative user testing, but also formative user research to help the cross-functional development teams to build an empathetic understanding of people's needs to inform and inspire what would get built based on what the technology would allow. So I needed to have researchers who could do the formative research and could also facilitate workshops. This We didn't call them design sprints at the time, but this was the mm the germ, the seed of what eventually became design sprints, you know, but but workshops is what I think we started calling them to bring everybody together to help with the ideation, not just like some engineer in his cube thinking, Oh, I'm going to invent something called Google base. And it's going to be this listing platform. (laughs) You know, we needed to put users in front of people up front. So that was one part of my strategy. Another part was to kind of define different types of design roles so that we would have like, you know, people who are really strong in prototyping, people who are really strong in interaction design, people who are really strong in visual design. And that really required changing the interview process, changing everybody on hiring committee, changing expectations that people had around what a successful designer at Google could potentially look like. And then even kind of like working within Larry's requirements and constraints and figuring out how to make sure that his concerns and needs were met, but also to be able to build up the bench strength of talent on the team. So Mm. project number one was like talent overhaul or augmentation, plus bringing in users in front of the cross-functional team so that designers could get involved early and upfront. Because what was happening before was like some engineer would say, oh, I, I put together this prototype of this idea I have for a product. 
I need a designer to go clean this up and make this look better. It's the lipstick on a pig problem, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's still a pig. Uh, <laughs> so, so we were in a lipstick on a pig kind of situation. Um, so we were trying to get out of that. And we also developed new hire orientation programs. Um, the thinking was that like Google was hiring at such a rapid rate that if we could come into new hire orientation in those first two weeks and tell new hires that this is the way we design products at Google, you know, by building an empathetic understanding of people, by trying things out, by testing them in the wild, by observing how they work, by iterating. Like if we could tell everybody, this is the normal way of working and designing at Google, that mm. eventually everybody will think that that was the way we did things. Yeah. And so when I joined Google, you know, we go through a two week boot camp for new hire orientation. They have these workshops called life of a dollar and life of a query. So it's like, yeah. how does Google search work? What happens when you type in a search in the keyword search box and you know, how does the technology work? And then there was life of a dollar. So life of a query, life of a dollar, the dollar was like on the ad side, how does the ads business work? And I was like, gosh, life of a query, life of a dollar. And out of all the things in our ecosystem that has a life is the users and there's no life of a user module. So that's what yeah. we created was life of a user. And so that was like the new hire training program around human centered design that we taught everybody. Nice. Um, because I think for design to succeed in a company, you need everybody caring about the user experience and it can't be just the jobs of the designers. You need everybody thinking about the product experience and how yeah. well it's working for people. So that was, that was our intention with that. So I heard that you brought actual people from IDEO into the company, <laughs> and uh, which is very exciting. It's very similar to what Intuit did. Actually, I'm not sure which, which process was first, but Intuit did a, a whole project with IDEO and, and they, they created this design thinking boot camp in the beginning of every uh beginning you know every new employee has to go through this design thinking boot camp and so I, i'd love to hear about that and you know we had uh, both jay knapp and john zaratsky to, who you know are authors of the sprint book on here and and i think jake spoke really highly of that those workshops those design thinking workshops mm -hmm. so i'd love to hear about them yeah the credit all goes to Charles Warren. Uh, he came from IDEO. I'm actually having lunch with him after I record this podcast. Nice. <laughs> um, he co-created IDEO's organization transformation practice. So at IDEO, he had already developed workshops to help companies, you know, elevate their abilities in terms of design thinking. And I had an internal advocate inside of Google, another executive named Deep Nishar, who uh, ran mobile at the time for Google. And he and I colluded to get Charles Warren through hiring committee because Charles was not a typical Google designer at the time. He did not have a computer science background. You know, he was, he did not code. And, mm. um, you know, somehow between me and deep, we got Charles hired um, because we shared the same vision and desire to bring in those kinds of skills into Google. So uh, when Charles joined, one of the first projects he worked on was, I mean, he worked on a lot of mobile stuff, but because he worked on mobile, and this is before smartphones were launched, <laughs> so right. he was still doing like SMS stuff, um, he launched a project in Uganda to look at how people might use the internet over SMS phones. And so this was an area that like most engineers were not really looking at. And so he was able to go in very scrappy, pull together a team, lead everybody through formative research and then a workshop to conceive of new product ideas. And they actually launched some things. And this is what inspired the whole UX team to kind of do more of this. Like he kind of showed what's possible and how mm. exhilarating work like this could be. Mm. And so then he developed a a program to train the UX team how to do this, how to facilitate a workshop, you know, with the sticky notes and the dot voting and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I mean, facilitation is a real, it's a, it's a tough skill. I've been in some poorly facilitated workshops where, you know, like people don't feel heard or somebody shoots down another person and then somebody ends up in tears. You know, facilitating effectively is an art. Um, mm. And Charles taught people how to do that. And then uh, Jake, I think, has always been very interested in process, got very interested and curious about how what Charles created, how that could evolve and grow and iterate. And I just gave him permission to do that. I mean, he, he came to me at some point and said, I'd like to spend some percentage of my time 
focusing on this? And I said, sure. And then when Larry became CEO, another thing he did was he decentralized all the functions. So rather than having a large centralized engineering team, a centralized product team, a centralized design team, everybody was decentralized into different product areas. And so that left me without an official role. And I had a few stragglers. I had Jake reporting to me because he was in this special role I had carved out for him to experiment with design sprints. And then this other guy, Sun Kwan Kim, who is like this amazing Korean designer who did just fabulous, fabulous visual design work. And now he's like SVP of design at line and has like 400 people reporting to him. I mean, he's just incredible. But at the time it was like the three of us and I had a growing interest in venture capital. And so I had this idea that we should go to Google Ventures and be sort of like a roving team. You know, Sun Kwan could work on visual design for portfolio companies. Jake could bring the design sprint mojo to portfolio companies. And I could advise CEOs and design leaders at an executive level on things like hiring strategy, organizational design, you know, more systemic issues that negatively impact design, for example. Mm-hmm. And so Braden Kowitz was like the main guy. Uh, he used to work for me. And at some point he had gone to Google Ventures. And so I went with to him with this proposal and he's like, oh, very interesting. And so then he followed with Jake and he brought Jake on, but he was concerned that Sun Quan didn't have the English skills needed to collaborate effectively with our portfolio companies. And then mm-hmm. I think for what I was potentially going to offer, I think at the time he didn't see the value or need in that, which is interesting because now I think that's quite a bit of what the GV team, uh, the design partners do there. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so Jake joined GV And then that turned into a whole thing. And I'm just so proud of all of them for creating what they built and really, you know, changing the practice of design across this industry at scale is just a remarkable thing. I love that Mm -hmm. they did not keep it within the walls of Google, but that they, you know, delivered it more broadly. And I'm always encouraging people to think that way and to do that because, you know, this profession is still very nascent and we're still figuring a lot of things out. And I think the more we can exchange information and help each other out, the better all of us will be. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And Jake told that story. I asked for permission to, uh, to, to try to see what we can do in a week and, uh, and try, to, try to bring these best practices. And uh, first of all, I mean, I think the world owes you. Thank you for just being there to uh, to protect him and and carve this niche for him. But clearly, uh, ended up proving to be a valuable thing, um, and definitely for me because we we run design sprints. Uh, that's that's all we do, and you know you can see the books behind me. Amazing. So you know you you helped my career as well, and so you you ended up leaving Google. You went to Udacity, uh, which I'm sure mm-hmm. has its own interesting stories. But I want to spend maybe some time on what you did next, which is working for Hosla Ventures. And I'd love to hear, you know, what attracted you to this world of venture funds? And you you said it it was already part of your thinking before. And yeah, so let's start with what attracted you to it and and how did you become involved? Yeah. So after Larry decentralized all the functions at Google in 2011, shortly after he became CEO, I was in this emeritus role at Google. And around that time, I was getting a lot of inquiries from entrepreneurs and former executives I had worked with who were asking me for advice. It would be anywhere from like, do you know anybody I can hire to, you know, how do I make design successful in my organization? You know, how do I make sure that my products are well designed and meet people's needs? I mean, the sum of all of these coffee dates was really worth a lot of my time. I got to a point where I felt like this is something I should charge because I I value my time. I wasn't really sure under what configuration that might mm. look like, but I had this idea that that there was a role that I could play in venture capital because I had so many CEOs asking me for this kind of advice. Mm. But you know, joining a VC firm, it's like a marriage because it can take like 10 years for a fund to pay out. So I thought it would be wise for me to just sort of prototype what that job might be like by joining uh, Trinity Ventures as an entrepreneur in residence, as an EIR. Mm. And that was a fixed three-month engagement that I did concurrent to my consulting period at Udacity, which started as a consulting period. And then eventually I got, I joined full time because I was spending so much time there. I was having so much fun. But, uh, you know, Vinod actually tried to recruit me to join Coastal Ventures in 2012. And I turned him down because, first of all, I didn't want, I wasn't sure I wanted to commit 
And second, I wasn't sure if I would like the world of venture capital. And then third, the world of venture capital at that time, it looked like the set of Mad Men. I mean, there were no women <laughs> in venture capital. The only women I saw in any of these firms were all admin. Mm. I, I wasn't sure that this was the right place for me. So I, I focused on the EIR role and Udacity, and I learned a lot of things. And this is where I, I kind of describe it as like applying design to my own life and to my own career. Like I prototyped something, I reflected on what worked and what didn't work for me. And then I iterated on that. And what I learned about myself as an EIR was like, I really loved collaborating with CEOs on their product and on their companies and just as an operator, but I hated investing (laughs) because, you know, like you have to be responsible for deal flow and hustle and get these entrepreneurs to talk to you. Then you listen to these pitches and, you know, there's like the obvious good ones and the obvious bad ones, but most of them fall into some fuzzy middle where it's like, oh, you know, and I would come home at the end of the day and I asked myself, like, what did I do today? And I would, I just felt like 99% of the time we turned down these entrepreneurs and I felt like I wasn't making anything. And that's when I decided that being like an investing partner or something was not really for me. Like, I just don't like that. And so at the same time that I was like on one side of the table, listening to pitches and looking at deals, I was on the other side at Udacity. Uh, I joined when there were 20 people and it was exhilarating, first of all, to go from running a team of like 400 people at Google to like, you know, a team of me and three other people <laughs> on my mm. design team at Udacity. And we were raising our Series B at the time that I joined. And so I was, I was sitting on both sides of the table, you know, concurrently. Mm. And I just loved being able to make again. I loved looking at what the potential product market fit could be, figuring out what the future of education might look like et cetera, et cetera. And so I think on a res at a resume level, it almost looks like a sideways move, like to the point where you're not even asking me questions about Udacity. But I think Mm. for people who are listening there, I I think like, it's really important to not discount these kinds of seemingly sideways kinds of career moves, because we Mm. all take away and learn something from it. And what I learned from it was like, it helped me build incredible empathy for the plight that entrepreneurs go through when they're like a small little startup with no product market fit. And they have countless business opportunities in front of them, figuring out how to prioritize, figure out which target user audience to focus on, what the product should be to satisfy their needs. It actually made me a much stronger and better person to be a potential design partner after Mm. my stint at Udacity in ways that I did not even expect or imagine when I first joined, like I just joined Udacity because I wanted to work with Sebastian and I wanted to work on education and it was fun. And their office was two blocks from my house and two blocks from the yoga studio where I taught. So it was like a Mm. perfect (laughs) arrangement. But, you know, once we found product market fit and we raised our series C, I was like, okay, the the job now is the same job I've done so many times over at Yahoo and Google, which is to build the team, build the product, et cetera. So I decided it was time to leave. And then two weeks later, Vinod called me and he said, now do you want to join? <laughs> and nice. um, much had changed in those two years because there were suddenly more women working at the firm. So that was how I ended up at Coastal Ventures. I, you know, I, I give this background because it's like, I think our careers are rarely linear. And I always kind of approached it with like, what is making my heart sing? It was never like a top down kind of deliberate, like, Oh, my ultimate plan for myself in five years is I want to be doing X, Y, and Z. It was never like that. It was always like, Hey, I'm kind of curious and interested about these certain things. Let me dig into that a little bit, spend some time doing that and reflect on what I like and don't like. And how do I want to be spending my time? And then Mm. just iterate based on that. So It is like applying design thinking to designing one's own life. Yeah. So, you know, let's take maybe a step back now and help me understand, you know, from your amazing journey and every, all the designers you met and all the interactions you've had with other specialties, what is design today? What is our role in the world? You know, how would you, how would you define a designer because I think this is, you know, a, a lot of us are in this, you know, in a place where we still have to explain what we do and why it's important. Yeah, this is a question that's very deep and dear to my heart, because I think the definition has become so broad and expansive, and it can mean so many 
different things depending on what level you're talking about. I think in the most straightforward interpretation, it's about how something looks, maybe how it looks and works or behaves, right? But but then at a deeper level, it really is about what is the intention and then how do you deliver on that and how well are you able to affect people's lives or affect the environment around you or the system that we operate in based on whatever it was your intention is. And then at another level, design is just a way of problem solving. It's like a a way of approaching, you know, everyday life and, and how do you go about addressing the challenges that you encounter? And I think all of those are valid and legitimate perspectives on design. So I did spend earlier parts of my career kind of like evangelizing design and talking about the importance of design and trying to define it. And I'm less interested in that now for a variety of reasons. I think that like, as I work with the entrepreneurs in my life, they need their problems solved. (laughs) And I think Mm -hmm. the best way to build currency for design and to get people sold on the value of design and what it is and things like that is to lead them through a journey where design is helping them with their problems and immediate needs. And so I think it's more about rolling up the sleeves and doing and delivering than it is about trying to get into some theoretical or abstract or philosophical or academic definition around design. For sure. I also think that, you know, and I was having a conversation with the Dean of College of Engineering at the University of Illinois because they have a new Siebel Center for Design. And so uh, this is kind of, it's potentially going to be kind of at the scale of the D school. And they have a lot of interesting questions around like, should this be like its own freestanding kind of certificate? Like you get a certificate in human centered design, or is it something that should be domain specific? You know, University of Illinois is an incredible school. Um, with amazing departments, especially in engineering, but also in, you know, psychology and biology and et cetera, et cetera. And mm. so what what might that look like if you mash up design with economics or design with biology or things like that? So, you know, there's this big debate about whether designers should know how to code, right? And nice. um, <laughs> I've always said, like, it's really important to know how something is made when you're designing in that medium. It's just going to make you a better designer. So if you're a software designer, it helps to know how software is made. If you're an architect, it helps to know structural engineering. If you're a fashion designer, it helps to know how to sew. Uh, If you watch Project Runway, the designers who don't know how to sew, they always lose. Mm. (laughs) They do. (laughs) It's just fact. So I, I think that design alone Sure, it's a way of thinking that anybody and everybody should learn, but that alone is not enough. You also have to know how to make, Mm. and that making is going to happen in some medium or another. And so it's important to know what that medium is, and that's Mm. the context in which you're operating. And it's important to understand that so that you can be more effective. Mm. Um, Sorry, I don't know if I'm directly answering your question, but it was such a broad, interesting question. (laughs) No, it's it's really interesting. So partly I'm interested in, you know, what, what is design? Another way of asking this is how is design's role evolving? How are the perceptions of design evolving? You have such a unique and and broad view, I think of industry and what's happening here. Do you see any overall trends? You know, I have this intuitive sense that maybe design is finally being recognized, that maybe design is beginning to be valued properly, beginning to have a, you know, much more of a bigger seat at the table, even in very, very deep tech companies. Do you feel the same thing? What, what, you know, what is your overview of what's happening today with design? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think companies definitely... CEOs definitely value and recognize uh, the importance of design more so now than ever before. I think that's driven by a number of factors. One is that technology is a commodity. It's really easy for anybody to just, you know, create a new company with very little capital. Um, Mm. There are all kinds of off-the-shelf toolkits that allow you to pull things together and then, bam, you have an app or a website or something. So with this proliferation of offerings out there, you know, technology has reached a certain level of maturity where design becomes a differentiator. So... Mm. People understand that they want to invest in design early and upfront. The biggest challenge right now is that there aren't enough designers to go around to to hire. I think another 
factor is that like we have now multiple generations of people who have kind of grown up with technology. And so our standards for what the tech should look and feel like in our everyday lives, it's an elevated, like we have elevated sensibilities, like Mm. Microsoft office and Oracle, like those kinds of interfaces are just not enough anymore. That's no longer the standard. Um, and so even, you know, companies that are doing back office type things, you know, like Gusto or Salesforce or whatever, they're investing a ton in design because they recognize how important it is to their success. So yeah, definitely. I, I think there's, greater value. I think that if anything, the challenge now is just hiring the talent. Mm. There is a definite severe talent shortage right now across the world. <laughs> wow, that's, that's interesting. Well, is it for, for those of us who are already in this field, as I guess it's, this is good news. Yeah. But, you know, I have two final questions. The first is about the human or even spiritual aspect of design. So you spoke about bad design as essentially a manifestation of vices like greed and attachment and, you know, acting out of fear and striving or ego and good design, you know, as the result of empathy and the result of, you know, if kind of, we take a step back, what, what is the spiritual or human meaning of design? You know, my daughter once asked me, So I'm a big, big fan of The Cure to the point I'm a super fan. Like I've seen them live like 40 times plus, and I've named my firstborn after two songs that they had as, you know, anyway, my, I took my, my, my daughter to her first Cure concert when she was nine years old. And then again, when she was 13 and, you know, and she used to ask me, she's like, mom, how do I know if the music that you listen to is good? I think it's good because you told me it's good, but how do I know if it's good? Mm. (laughs) And I told her like, ultimately music is good depending on how it makes you feel. How does music make you feel? Does it make you feel seen and heard? And I think design is the same way. Like we perceive something to be well designed when it makes us, when an experience makes us feel seen, like, Mm. ah, somebody anticipated my needs before I even understood that I needed it myself. Or how did it make me feel in terms of not only being seen, but did it bring me joy? Do I feel loved? Mm. Did it make me happy? You know, and so that's ultimately what we're leaving people with as we design things is we're leaving them with a feeling and that feeling can be a whole range of things. But I think it's important Mm. for us to be very intentional and deliberate about what kind of energy are we bringing into this world? So it's not just like, are we making things easy for people or is it something that people will be addicted to so that we can bring in a lot of advertising revenue or whatever but, you know, it, it really is an offering that we're giving. It's, it's, it's mm. energy we're putting out into the world. And so that's like an individual choice that we're making, but one that has to be very deliberate and thoughtful. And in order for us to deliver effectively on whatever emotion it is that we're trying to imbue on a recipient, it means that we have to understand them really well. I mean, we have to understand them as well as we understand ourselves. And I would say some people don't even understand themselves really well. Mm. So it really invokes a different part of the brain than this kind of analytical, you know, kind of A-B testing or like, you know, usability benchmarking kind of thing. But it's, it's really about, hopefully, we aspire to bring feelings of joy, love, efficiency, efficacy, confidence, you know, things like that to the people who mm. use whatever it is that we are creating. Yeah. You, you, you said you, we become a little bit more like the, the products we use. And you said that design is the best gift that we yes. can make to others by becoming better ourselves. We are able to produce these products that can bring some of what we learn to others. And I think that's, that's really, really beautiful. So I have this final closing question that everyone, you know, is, is expecting. So in his TED talk, philosopher Alain de Botton talks about the difference between a lecture and a sermon. A lecture being information, you make up your own mind about it. It's a, a secular way of doing things. And he kind of longs for the days of sermons where, you know, a sermon is a passionate plea to change someone's life. And, you know, it takes the person seriously and says, you should do this. This will really change your life. 
So if you were to give a very short sermon, what would it be about? <laughs> wow, I wish I had heard this question before I started talking to you because I feel like I need to contemplate it a little bit longer. But, um, you know, I, I would like to see more in this world, better listening and understanding and just more love. Like, I think that's ultimately what we should all aspire to do is to listen and to love. And uh, that is a, a daily practice and mm -hmm. it requires us to be awake within ourselves to do that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a beautiful sermon. This was a wonderful conversation. Thanks, Irene. Thank you so much for having me. Remake is produced by myself and Regina Rothstein. Research and editing by Louis Brady. And audio engineering by Greg Cocoveos. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also just makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. We're a global strategic design speed agency aimed at improving outcomes through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone, and see you next week on Remake.